Well, good morning and welcome to a Federated Church. We have been in a series, Route 66, if you're joining us for the first time. And uh, Route 66 is the 66 books of the Bible. And we are now in week three of that. We started with Genesis. At the beginning, why not? Because we discovered on that week that everything begins with God. Our word for that morning was beginnings. Last week, we went through Exodus, and we looked at the theme of God draws us to himself. We talked about our keyword being exit, because it's about God drawing us out and then drawing us in, just as he did with the Israelites, out of Egypt and slavery and into his possession. We've been studying through the first five books. That's kind of how we've sectioned this off in the first five weeks. They're the books of the law, or as we have stated, that is our big word right now, the Pentateuch. And as always, if you want to try to type that in in the comments and spell it correctly, you get bonus points. Now, we come from a position of excitement with Genesis and excitement with Exodus, these stories, these amazing things. I mean, the creation of the world and the epic adventure that God created with the Israelites taking that out of Egypt. And then we get to number three in the Pentateuch, in the books of the law. We come to Leviticus. I can hear the roaring crowds right now as we get into Leviticus. You know, Leviticus is kind of like the town of Radiator Springs. Anybody remember Radiator Springs? Have you seen the movie Cars? Disney's Cars. This is the rundown town, and Leviticus is kind of like Radiator Springs. It was once adored, now ignored. In ancient Israel, this book was actually held in the highest regard. It was held in the highest of esteem. The children were taught from this book, and they were memorizing from its text. It was a worship manual as well for the people of Israel, because the book of Leviticus was the delivery of the law of God. This was the rule book. This is where the Ten Commandments were expanded upon, and, and the idea of order began within the scope of the nation of Israel. These days, I, I can tell there are people that get excited to read through their Bible. They take a challenge. I'm going to do the one-year challenge. I'm going to read through the Bible, and, and they get into it, and they get to Leviticus and get totally lost, just completely lost. It's, it's confounding to some people sometimes, but here's the problem. This book has an unbelievably powerful message, and we overlook it. This book helps to teach us about the concept of being clean before a clean, pure, and perfect God. I mean, what's the phrase, right? Cleanliness is next to godliness, right? Yeah, cleanliness is next to godliness. You know, it makes me think of some funny thoughts about the idea of being clean and cleanliness, and, and first of all, here's this one for you. The true short story of every parent. If you're a parent, you're going to get this. If you were a parent, you're going to get this. If you're not a parent yet, and you will be in the future, <laughs> this is what's coming. This is how it goes. My house was clean. The kids woke up. The end. And what, what, what about this? What about this? When it's your turn to host a gathering, and people ask what they can bring. This is like a modern take. You're going to host a gathering. People say, hey, what can I bring along? And your response is, dark socks and low expectations. So let's get to some facts, some basic facts here from Leviticus. All right? We've done this every week. The authorship, again, attributed to Moses. As you can tell, there's kind of a pattern with the books of the law as far as who authored these and who God spoke to to put this down for the sake of the history of Israel. So Moses is attributed as the author, it was written post Mount Sinai. So being the rule book, being the expansion, this was written post Mount Sinai, post the giving of the Ten Commandments. And there are 36 chapters that make up the book of Leviticus. Now, if we're going to define this, uh, first I want to restate the fact that Leviticus acts or represents itself like a rule book. So let's keep that in mind. Because the book of Leviticus contains a specific word, a specific thematic element that is one of the fundamental principles of Christian following. Okay, this is a fundamental, fundamental principle of what Christianity is all about. And that focus word is 
holiness. So our teaching this morning, I want us to give Leviticus this theme. God lives with a holy people. God lives with a holy people. And that concept should be coupled with the already, with the already stated theme gives us this. What would be the key word then? Well, kind of already stated it. There's going to be a pattern here. Key word, holiness. Holiness is the key word. Some key scriptures for you to consider. Chapter 17, verse 11, and chapter 19, verse 18. But there's a primary key verse that we will deliver this morning, and that is chapter 19, verse 2. Coupling with the theme. You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. You're going to see the pattern here. There is a structure involved in Le Leviticus. Now, as I said, it's a rule book. So keep that in mind as we walk through the four points here of the structure of Leviticus. As we're going through our survey informational section here of the book. Chapters 1 through 7 are the rules for sacrifice. Chapters 8 through 10 are the rules for the priesthood. Chapters 11 to 16 are the rules for purity. And chapters 17 through 27 are the rules for holiness. Had to fit that in there, didn't we? You know, that thematic following. Now, as we dive into this understanding, as we dive into the application of holiness, we got to see where everything's coming from. Because as Exodus ended, everything was all joy. They'd been rescued. They'd been set free from their slavery. And they had praised God and worshipped God. And they had been put into a place where he had developed everything within them. He brought his presence into them. He had given them the right to be his people at a new level. And God's glory was in full central placement with his people, dwelling among them in his holy tent in the tabernacle. But if God is the epitome of unfathomable holiness, how can we approach him? How can a sinful, unrighteous people approach a holy God? How can an unholy people live in the presence of a holy God? Now, the rules that were then are different from the rules are that exist now. But God still requires holiness in the lives of those with whom he chooses to dwell. So it is said, yet again, in that way, as we have with our theme this morning, God lives with holy people. It doesn't say God lives with unholy people. God lives with holy people. And that's the foundational statement we rely on as we look at the principles and the themes of holiness. Now, this word holiness, it appears in Scripture over 1,000 times. Probably means we should be paying attention, doesn't it? Now, this is an attribute of God. If fundamental principle of God, something that is attributed to him that he then wants to attribute to us. There are many things in that way, but I'm not so sure that our first thought when we think of who God is, that the first thought in our head is holy. I don't know that anybody, that that's the first place they would go. So I pose this question to you this morning. If you were in one of those just instantaneous, say the first thing that comes to your mind, I want you to fill in this blank. As you're watching online, as you're checking this out, I want you to put this in the comments too, okay? Fill in this blank. God is blank. God is blank. Type it out. I want to read them later. Type it out. God is blank. I know there's going to be a ton of answers to this. There's so many different things that can enter into that blank because of the character of who God truly is. But we start today by putting in that blank what might be the primary attribute of God. Anybody have any idea where we're going with this? I bet some of you probably do. So this is our first point, that attribute of God. I told you it's going to be recognized. You're going to get used to this. God is holy. God is holy. A primary attribute indeed because of the definition because of the definition of what holy really means, we see God in these ways. We see him as separate, set apart, different, distinct, pure. And this is exactly why he is trying to direct us to be like him. Does he not desire that we are different? Does he not desire that we are set apart? Does he not desire that we are also pure? In Leviticus 11, it says this, 
I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves. Be holy because I am holy. Do not make yourselves unclean by any creature that moves about on the ground. I am the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore, be holy because I am holy. We're seeing it again, our primary verse. 19.2, you should be holy for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. Again, in chapter 20, verse 26, you shall be holy to me for I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you, there we get definition, from the peoples, that you should be mine. That you should be mine. See, God is holy. He desires us to be holy. But we skim past this idea. It's a word. It's an attribute. It's a description. It's a defined idea of Christianity that we so quickly just go, oh yeah, holiness, I get it. We tend to instead put our focus more on the idea of love. <laughs> How many of you typed that into the comments? God is <laughs> love. I bet there's a lot of people talking God is love. But holiness, being holy, being set apart by God, being separate as God is, being holy as He is, does that mean, not mean that it will produce those other elements? Those other characteristics. We think of the fruit of the Spirit. To choose His Spirit is to choose to seek to be holy. He says, be holy because I am holy. And thus, if we're doing that and seeking that, then the fruit that is sought after as well will be developed within us. When we accept that relationship, when we come into contact with that in a new way and we are changed and the change happens... Holiness sets in, and holiness then, through the sanctifying process, develops that fruit that the Spirit gives us. This is a primary attribute that He clearly wants us to desire and obtain. And it's not just the desire. That's the best part. It's not just the desire. No, 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 no. God insists on this attribute within us. And that's the second point of the attribute. God insists that you and I be, oh, no surprise, holy. We're getting the pattern now, aren't we? If he so desperately wants this for us, then how does this happen? There has to be a development process. There has to be something that is unfolded before us that allows us to get there. But first, I think we need to know why. I think the first thing is why. You know, a lot of times we say, don't ask why. It's a waste of time with God. But here's the thing. This time we can actually ask why because God has given the answers as to why he would insist that we would be holy. Here's the four whys. Number one, because God saved us out of our unholiness. Number two, why? Because God will not live with an unholy people. Why? Number three, because God insists on holy worship. And why, number four, because God insists on holy living. Now see, we understand the why, but like I said, how does it make it happen? If God gives us the why, the, the whys that are answered because of this and because of that, then the how has to come from a source, and that source is God. God saves us from our unholiness. Only God saves us from our unholiness. Leviticus 18. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt where you live. And you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan to which I'm bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. You shall follow my rules and keep my statutes and walk in them. I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. And if a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. Do you, you see the directness there, the authoritative nature? He's saying, I am holy. You need to be holy. And the only way that that is going to happen is if you allow me to work the saving that is needed for you to get there. You're not going to do it by your own power. It's not by any statutes set down by man. It is by the rules, the statutes, and the authority that I bring, for I am the Lord. I am will be the one that makes you holy, and you will get there by following what I have told you to do. 
God established His way. He established His commandments. He took the people of Israel out of the falsehood of Egypt. He saved them from the influence of Canaan when they once reached the promised land. And the choice to follow His way, that is salvation. A holy life, a different life, a life set apart from what they have seen and heard and experienced. And this is His desire for us also. This is what He wants from us. God saves us from our unholiness. The second why that translates to how is that He cannot live with an unholy people. Leviticus 10. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which He had not commanded of them. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. See, it wasn't done in God's way. They did it in their own way. They thought that they could take control and do it the way they wanted to do it. And what happened? Their own incense fire of offering that was unauthorized is what was their end. They didn't do it God's way. They did it their way. And they paid for it with their lives. Does this not sound like a few other people that might come to mind? I don't know, maybe the towns of Sodom and Gomorrah. Complete and utter lack for any sort of authoritative nature of the higher power. Did everything by their own way and lived in deep sin and immorality. And what happened? Fire came down and poof, there it goes. Or how about looking ahead in Scripture, to Ananias and Sapphira. Here, they decide that they are going to present themselves as holy people of God, but in doing so, they lie about the profits that they made on the sale that they were giving of this money to the church. And in that lie, they were caught in it red-handed. And what happened? They dropped dead. They paid for it with their life because they were going to do it their way, presenting themselves as holy, as opposed to God's way and allowing Him to make them. Holy. God saved us from the unholiness that surrounded us, and He does not desire to live with an unholy people. He desires the change, the change of heart, the obedience, and that comes in the third wide of the how through holy worship. Leviticus 1 through 16 speaks to this, and it's not just the ideas that you're thinking of. This is real authentic worship. It's not just emotions that may be inside you. There's too much romanticism around this idea of worship these days. There's too much emotion involved in it. The worship that he's speaking of, the worship that he has set forth and the rules that he puts there, this is a view of the relationship that is in that worship. It's not like that puppy love. You know that first time that you start to get with somebody, it's that new love. It's, oh, it's so gushy and the emotions just overflow. Oh, I love you so much. We have those moments with God. We do. But that's not what's being talked of here. This is talking about a worship that is established. Established through real connection of the heart and mind and the presence of the Spirit speaking to God. And when are we really connected in that worship? Well, that's the fourth why that becomes the how, and that's the holy living. We must live in holiness because that's then how the worship becomes that real established relationship connection because, guys, worship isn't showing up on a Sunday morning and singing songs. Life, life is worship. And holy worship brings holy life. And holy life brings holy worship. They're connected together. They are a partnership in relationship with Jesus. Making the choice to follow the commands of God. And being an example that looks different. He insists on holy worship and on holy living. Because he himself is holy. He cannot live amongst an unholy people. Because He is holy, then our hearts should crave that same holy idea. But we fall short, as the Israelites did, as we all do, because we're born into that sin. We can't help it. It's part of the destructive nature of having to be human. 
we fail, we're weak, so we have to overcome. Well, how do we overcome? It's like, here, you've got the wise, and you just want me to be holy, and you want me to follow you and everything, but I'm going to fail. You can't live with an unholy person? Well, I'm pretty much an unholy person. That's why we need God. That's how we overcome. How can we be an unholy people like Israel was and be in the presence of the holy God? Because God himself will make you, <laughs> here it is, holy. We don't do it under our own guise and power. God himself is who makes us holy. We have to go to him. Don't you remember this? From Genesis, everything begins with God. Even this process, everything begins with God. Can I get an amen on that one? I mean, seriously, type that in the comments. Because without him, we're nothing. Without him, we don't get there. We have to have him. Now, don't be confused on this. I'm giving you a heads up on this right now. Don't be confused on how you come to God and allow him to make you holy. I don't want you to be confused on that process. It's so deeply important to understand this. So here's three steps, three steps, okay, in the process of becoming holy under the authority of God. Step one, we come to him through the blood. The blood has to cover. That's where it's at. That's where it started. If that wasn't where it started, why would he even send Jesus to die in the first place? What was the point? The point is, is the only way he makes us holy is if we come to him through the blood. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. The blood is the covering. It always was, and it always will be. Leviticus 17, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. It is the blood that makes atonement by the life. It's the blood that covers... See, this for the Israelites, this was an instruction in the law of sacrifice. They'd bring a male without blemish, and they would bring it to the tent of God, to the priest, and they would put their hand on its head, and they would, sorry, getting graphic, slit its throat and kill it. And that blood would rush out, and they would catch it, and the priest would throw the blood on the sides of the altar, and they would cover the altar with that, and then they would put the offering up on the top of the altar and they would light it as a burnt offering on the altar. And this was an atonement for the family. It was the, the blood that was on the altar, the blood that would be running over the sides and would burn up and be lifted as a fragrant offering to God. That was the was. But see, for us, it exists in the what is. That's what was. We have the what is. 1 John 1, 7 but if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. A sacrifice is made. The blood has been spread and we're called to walk in the light as he is in the light. I.e., it's John's New Testament way of saying, hey, be holy as he is holy. And the blood of Jesus covers us. But walking in that light means we acknowledge the sin. We have to acknowledge the sin because the blood is meant to cover that sin just as they acknowledged their need with their sacrifice when they brought that. So we have to acknowledge it. So we are covered by the blood, but we must, number two, confess our unholiness. This is kind of an imperative part because if we're not willing to repent, if we're not willing to go and say, hey, I've done wrong and I need to be covered in that blood, we're kind of going to miss out on the point. When they gave sacrifice, it was a confession of sin. They brought that because they knew that they had wronged someone or, or something in the process. They'd broken within the law and they needed that atonement. The law that was given in Leviticus 4 and 5 as to the complete process of understanding for the confessing of sin and guilt was there. But this was their cry out to God. This, this moment of sacrifice was their cry out to God for forgiveness. God, we need you to forgive us. And the action that was taken in accordance with it, to cry out to God an honest admittance of our wrong, that's our requirement in the process. Believe it or not, look at there. There's actually something that we have to do under our power in this process. We have to be willing to confess our unholiness. David was a master at this. David was an utter master at this. Psalm 139, 23, and 24. 
I've used this verse before, I'm using it again because it's such a powerful example of the idea of true confession, vulnerability, and transparency before God. This is one of my favorite verses. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in your way everlasting. We need to require that deep desire to cry out, to be searched, to be known by God in that way so that the Spirit wells up within us to want to cause that unholiness to be gone so that it makes us desire to confess what we know is inappropriate in our lives. And when we are, then God covers us in His love. 1 John 1, 9, but the first part only says, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. We'll get to the rest in a minute. But right now, that's, that's what we need to focus on. Confess our sins. He's faithful and just to what? Forgive us our sins. Confession will breed the forgiveness. Then and now, a sacrifice that forgives. When we admit the sin, when we admit the guilt and wrong, God will forgive us. But now, now he goes beyond that. Because it is He that makes us holy, even though it's our part to confess. It's His blood that covers. And when He makes us holy, because that's the process, it's done by Him, and He does so by making us clean, then the third step comes in. You see that forgiveness? God cleanses us. Somebody, somebody said, that'll preach. You can type that in. That'll preach. That God cleanses us. His blood covers. We confess and He cleanses us. And he tells this to the people of Israel over and over and over again that this is through his power if they will just follow. He lays it out in the law, that covering for guilt and shame. Multiple places in Leviticus, he says, I am the Lord who sanctifies them. Not, these are the priests that sanctify you. Moses who sanctifies you. No, I am the Lord. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. The sanctification process means forgiveness, cleansing, making clean. It's a continual process. Do we not realize this in our sinful nature as humans? How many second chances have we received from God? The same goes for us today as we see our role unfold. We confess. He forgives. And then as we said in 1 John 1, 9, we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And the second part, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Not just this thing here or this thing here. No, when we go and we confess and He forgives us, He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Well, how does He do that? He casts it in the sea of forgetfulness. We say forgive and forget. No, God forgives and chooses not to remember. He casts it as far as the east is from the west. Well, how far is that? Well, I don't know. It's a continual process when you go east and you go east and you go east and you go east. It never stops. And you go west and you go west and you go west. It never stops. See, God has done the dirty work. He picks us up. He brushes us off. He cleans us up. The process begins with God because only He can make us holy. This is how Jesus came and fulfilled the law. Don't mistake that. He fulfilled it. He did not abide. Abolish it. He fulfilled it as the ultimate sacrificial lamb in order to cleanse us, forgive us, and make us a holy people for him. I said not to get confused here because we have that part to play, but I don't want you to really think or get into this idea that it has anything really to do with us. I talked about how confessions are part, and we are required to do that, but I don't want you to get confused and think that this somehow has something to do with us. I hope that's not confusing or contradicting after I say that. But it's because God says, just come. Just come to me. I can forgive you. I can cleanse you. I've got rest like you wouldn't even believe. If you lay those burdens down, if you confess that stuff, let me tell you how that's going to feel if you're willing to do that. God shows this in Exodus with the drawing out and the drawing in, and then he produces that level of precedence by giving the commands and setting down the authoritative law in Leviticus. He says, build your life upon me. Lean upon me. Let me take care of it. It's not complicated. 
It's not complicated. To, to get there is not complicated. After that, I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but to get there, when I say I'm the way, the truth, and the life, I mean it. Just come. Just confess your need. Let me handle the heavy lifting. Be holy. Because I, I am holy. Come. Build your life upon me. Let's pray. Father, let us never presume to think that we are capable of taking care of this stuff ourselves. May we be reminded all of the time that we're covered by the blood, that our confession to you of our wrongs leads to forgiveness and a cleansing. Father, if there's anybody holding on to anything that's, that they just can't seem to let go of it, I pray that your spirit right now would prompt and would, would break that wide open and that they would be able to share that maybe with someone who they trust as well as then being able to have that person help them take it to you. So that, Father, they can continue that process or maybe even just begin that process of being holy, made holy by the Holy God. Thank you, Father, that you forgive and cleanse us. And thank you, Father, that that is how you create the process of making us a holy people so that you, you will willingly dwell in and among us. For it is not what we deserve. We give you praise and thanks, and it's in your precious name we pray these things. Amen.